please join us in welcoming Nicole Trombley of Pillar Wellness for a talk on the five pillars of wellness. My name is Nicole Trombley, as Kristen mentioned, and I hope you're all excited as I am to be here. I'm really honored and thrilled to be here this evening. This is a good crowd. You all look so cozy in those chairs. <laughs> I kind of wish I could, well, anyway. Um, but I really love the setup here. It's very, this is such a wonderful and comfortable place, and it really is an honor to come here and talk to you all this evening. So as Kirsten mentioned, my name is Nicole Trombley. I'm a wellness coach, I'm an educator, I'm a public speaker, a trainer, and a nutritionist. So I do a lot. This is probably the most favorite thing that I do in my line of work, is talking to groups of people, inspiring people, giving hope, and encouraging people to participate in their own health. So I have a, about four or five years ago, I started my own company called Pillar Wellness, and we do a lot. There are nine of us to date, and we essentially design and implement wellness programs. These days, mostly for companies, but also for groups, and we also work one-on-one -on -one with individuals like yourself. And in the past year, I've actually had the opportunity to work with a lot of people like yourselves that are either stricken with cancer or you know somebody that is stricken with cancer through the UPMC Integrative Oncology Program. Just curiously, anyone here familiar with the UPMC Integrative Oncology Program? Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Um, and so through that program, I've actually gotten back into working a lot with individuals and I just absolutely love it. I really absolutely love it. I've met some wonderful people through this program and I really can't speak highly enough about what our clubhouse, as you know, and what the UPMC Integrative Oncology Program is doing. So if you want to know more about that program, see me afterwards. Anyway, as I mentioned, this is truly what I love to do is inspire people. So my, my field is health and wellness, and I find that it can be very intimidating, especially for folks like yourself. I also find that there's a lot of myths out there. I find that there's a lot of misinformation. And I've really grown to love helping people and guide them in the right direction and make health and wellness more accessible because most people think that this is, this is very intimidating. Does anyone in here think health and wellness is intimidating? No? Oh, you guys are gonna be really easy then. <laughs> Uh, I also have a very strong passion for cancer. Um, I will tell this story. I'm an only child of a single parent, and when I was a baby, my mom and I moved back in with her parents, my grandparents, and my mom always worked, and I was very, very close with my grandmother. And for all intents and purposes, she raised me until I was about seven years old. So I was young, but, you know, formative years. And I remember when I was seven years old, I remember my mom coming into my bedroom to tuck me in, and after my story, she told me that my grandmother had lung cancer. And at the time, I mean, I was seven. I didn't have much exposure to cancer. I didn't really know what she meant. I just knew that she was going to die from that. And the way that my mom sort of presented it to me at the time, I didn't know that there was any other option for her. And I was truly devastated. And I, I remember that day like it was yesterday. And over the course of a year, I watched her deteriorate. And I don't think that they had, you know, the same technologies, obviously, back then that they do now. And it was, it was a year of my life that I will never forget. Sometimes I wish I could, but I will never forget it. And I would read to her bedside, and I just, I, I was so affected uh, by the disease, even though it wasn't me personally, but it was somebody that was very dear to me, and I never forgot it. And so. All my life, I've been doing things geared toward the benefit of folks with cancer or that are affected by cancer. And so that's why I jumped at the opportunity to come here and speak to you all about this. So just a little, just a little background on myself. So having said all of that, let's get started. So I've told you, let's see here. I've told you... Press every button. <laughs> That's okay. 
when Kirsten comes back, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up. But so far I've told you who I am, I've told you what I do, now I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do this evening. So this evening we're gonna talk about the five pillars of wellness, which are activity level, good nutrition, stress management, mindfulness. I could not advance. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. Where was I? Activity level, good nutrition, stress management, mindfulness, and support system. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the creation of the five pillars and how we arrived at those. Mainly, we're going to talk about lifestyle. I'm gonna keep it very general and non-specific because all of you are different in this room, although we do have a lot of similarity. But also, I, it, this can be overwhelming, and I have a lot of information to share with you this evening, so I wanted to keep it general so that it applies to all of us. Also, we're gonna really focus on lifestyle changes, so I wanna give you all some lifestyle changes that you can do that are simple, not always easy, but simple, that will make a huge difference in your life. Any questions so far? No, okay, easy, easy crowd so far. Before we do that, I wanna share some findings, if you will, that I've discovered over the years in working with people. And so, just a little bit of background about how I, how I got to doing what I do. I went to college for psychology, which is my first passion. So my first passion is people. People like you, people like me, why we do the things that we do, what motivates us, fear, obstacle, all of that. I just find it very interesting. And I also have a degree in public relations and I also got a degree in nutrition because nutrition was sort of a side hobby. I never thought that I would actually do anything with it. I worked in PR for a couple years after college and I absolutely hated it. I absolutely hated it. It was not for me. Sitting at a desk all day, I don't need to go into the rigmarole of it, but it just wasn't for me. And so at the time, my boss sent me to see a life coach. And I think, you know, eight years ago, life coaches weren't, were few and far between. So she was really ahead of her time. And she knew that I was miserable, and we talked a lot about what my interests were. And I loved health and wellness, and I loved people. And she said, well, Nicole, you really need to make a life out of what you love. And we talked about what that meant and what that might look like, and I just didn't buy it. I just didn't buy it. I didn't think, I thought, you know, I went to this great four-year college, I got a degree, I'm smart, you know, I should be working in corporate America doing some, you know, fancy job where I get to dress up every day. And I did that, and I hated it. And so. A few years later, I found myself back in Pittsburgh. I really sort of hit bottom in a number of ways and decided that I needed to reinvent myself. And so I decided that I was going to try personal training at a gym. One, because I wanted the free membership, and two, because, you know, I just really enjoyed health and wellness, and I enjoy people. And just after a few weeks of doing that, I really, I really found my calling. And it wasn't because it was showing people to exercise, because quite frankly, anybody can show someone else how to exercise. What I really loved was understanding people and relating to a person and really finding out, well, what is it about yourself that you want to change? You know, and what I found is that most often people want to change a lot more than their exterior appearance and that that isn't always the full story. And so I did that for a few years and I've learned some pretty basic truths about humans that I'm going to share before we go into the five pillars of wellness. So the first one, is it's an, in, well, let me ask you this before I do that. When I say wellness, what, what do you think of? What does that mean to all of you? Just blurt it out. And I know names. No one does. Taking care of yourself. Taking care of yourself. Good. Being proactive. Being proactive. What else? I didn't hear the, the folks in the back. Being healthy. Being healthy. Feeling at peace with yourself. That's a good one. They're all good. Anyone else? All of those are wonderful answers. <sighs> to me, my definition of wellness is anything that happens in your life within a 24-hour period. It's everything. Everything that makes you who you are, because that's all important. Wellness also, and Karen almost hit on it a little bit there, is also feeling comfortable inside your own body, whatever the circumstances are, okay? That's my defini a definition of wellness, and we're gonna touch on all of that. So the first human truth that I've found over the years is that it's an inside job. So what does that mean? Well, most often I find that people spend way too much time and energy and money trying to fix the outside. People spend a lot of money 
trying to fix the exterior when really I think it's, it's an inside job. It starts here. And so often I find people, and I, I'm gonna relate a lot to exercise because I did that for so long. I know we're not all gonna talk about exercise tonight, but a lot of people wanna lose weight, they wanna look good, you know, they wanna fix their appearance somehow, but it's really trying to fix something else that doesn't feel right inside. And oftentimes people are unsuccessful doing those exterior things because it has to start here. The inside has to match the outside. Does that make sense? Okay, wonderful. It's an inside job. Next, the other human reality about wellness is that it's about lifestyle. And so, Pillar Wellness, we do not sell diets. If I say diet at all this evening, I mean diet in the sense of how we eat, not necessarily diet how we all think about diet, that it's a temporary way of eating to arrive at a goal and then you stop. It's about your lifestyle. I've had the most success with people and groups over the years where we say, okay, we're gonna focus on improving your overall lifestyle. That's the goal. And then we'll make some specific objectives. Okay, it's not, I wanna lose five pounds. Because if you're thinking about a number, you're obsessing about one thing, it makes it a lot more difficult than improving the overall picture. And when you take, you know, take your eye off of the, the, the lens and see the bigger, the bigger telescope picture, that's what's important. And that's what's gonna get you reaching your smaller goals and your objectives. So it's about lifestyle. The third, people make time for what they think is important. And this is a biggie. Because oftentimes when I work with people about improving their lifestyle or making healthy changes, people always say, I don't have the time. And I say, I don't believe you. That's just not true. Because every single one of us in here wastes time doing something. I don't care who you are or what you do. We do mindless things in and every, in and every day. It, it just, we're human, that's what we do, and that's okay. But don't tell me that you don't have the time to make healthy lifestyle changes. The issue is, it's a step back, it's an inside job, so you have to really think that something's important for you to implement it into your life. If you don't think that eating well is, is, is important, then you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna find time to buy healthy things and to make healthy meals and cook and et cetera, et cetera. Make sense? If you don't think exercise is important for you, you're not gonna find time to do it. If you think that stress is, the stress in your life is so overwhelming and there's really nothing you can do about it because you're helpless, you're not gonna make time for a stress management program. So people will make time for what's important. And so if you're going to think about even, if you're even thinking about making a change, the first step is to find out why it's important for you to do that and to remind yourself of that on a daily basis. And we'll talk more about that. I call that finding your why. Next, anytime we, work with, anytime we work with people or groups, we emphasize what I call honest self-inventory. And you'll hear me say this throughout this entire evening, that awareness is the first step. So before we can change anything about ourselves, we have to have a really solid picture of our reality. And so if you wanna change the way that you eat, you have to know what you eat like now. You have to know what kind of foods you eat and when you eat them and how you eat them. You know, the behavior around eating is also just as important as the foods that we eat. And so and you, if you want to improve your exercise program, well, you have to have an honest evaluation of well, what does it look like now? Is it working? You see, where I'm, you see where I'm going with that. So awareness is always the first step. The two biggest factors in changing behavior Anyone want to take a stab at this? What are the two biggest fact? Well, this is my opinion. Anyone want to take a stab on my opinion of what the two biggest factors are in making lasting changes in your life? Anyone? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. I'm gonna add that. Maybe I'll have three. That's not one of mine, but that's a good one. You have to take baby steps. Baby steps. To do it. That's also a good one. So both of you actually, I have a recipe for successful change all the way at the end and both of those are on the list. For this, for all intents and purposes, the two biggest factors in changing behavior is confidence and intrinsic motivation, finding your why. And so first and foremost, you have to believe that something is important for you to do it, and secondly, you have to believe that you can do it. This is really important, because a lot of people that I speak with, they just tell me that they can't do something. 
And then that's a bigger conversation. We have to kind of go mm. dig, dig under that a little bit. Well, why do you think that you can't do something? You have to really believe that you can. And there are ways around that. Um, I don't want everyone in this room to think that just because you think you can't do something, that automatically means that you can't in the world of health and wellness. And lastly, and I say that last for a reason because this is one of my favorites. <clears throat> this is the final human truth that I found over the years is that it's really important to focus on what we can control and stop obsessing over what we cannot. Does that sound familiar? That sounds familiar, right? The serenity prayer, for some of you I'm sure that know that, profound. I mean, we could just talk about, we could dissect the serenity prayer and leave better people because it's so true. And in every single interaction when I work with people, I want to talk about the solution. I don't want to talk about the problem too long. Sometimes I need information, but it's all about getting into the solution, you know. And that's my message, especially for all of you in here this evening, because all of you have a special circumstance. You're different than most groups that I normally speak to. You have a unique set of circumstances. And <clears throat> I want you to know that there's always something you can do. Because at the end of the day, regardless of how you feel or regardless of what your circumstances are, there's always something that you can do to make yourself feel better, even if it's just the slightest change of attitude. And we'll talk more about that. So, any questions on human realities? Anyone have a comment? Stop me if I'm moving too quickly. I hope I didn't miss anything. No? No questions? Okay, so we're going to get into the five pillars of wellness next. So I, it's, the five pillars of wellness, how I define it is a holistic health management plan that focuses on lifestyle behaviors. So all of you really have an idea, truly, of what a health management plan is. Our health management plan really just focuses on behaviors. So rather than sell one sort of prescription for eating or one exercise program, we really just talk about your behaviors around those things. So as I mentioned, the five pillars of wellness are activity level, good nutrition, stress management, mindfulness, and support system. I believe that everything that happens within a 24-hour period, I could make a really good argument that it would fit under one of these five pillars. So, and maybe we need to add one. I don't know. We can talk about that later, too. So the first one is activity level. So why not call this exercise? In my opinion, activity level and exercise are two different things. So all exercise is activity level, but not all activity level is exercise. Does that make sense? Your activity level is just how much you move in any given day. To me, exercise is where I say that I'm going to give myself a certain amount of time allotted for the purpose of exercising or moving a little bit more than the rest of the day. Does that make sense? So again, I don't know that it's important for everyone in this room to exercise, but I do believe that it's important for everybody in this room to have a good activity level, a good sense of activity level. It's going to be different for everybody in this room because you all have a different set of circumstances, right? You're working with medications and treatments and you're working with your energy level. And so you really have to be in tune with your body and what's normal and what feels good and what feel, doesn't feel good and what you can do realistically in any given day. And so that's why I call it activity level. I often tell people, I say this all the time, that some people set aside time to exercise during the week, but yet they're sedentary the rest of their life. So I wouldn't necessarily call them active. I would say, yes, you exercise, but the, it's the big picture. It's the lifestyle, correct? It's not just about, you know, I remember when I was, when I was a personal trainer and I would work with people twice a week for an hour. And these people would expect miracles from me. And I would say, let's see, how many hours are there in a week? 200 and some, right? Something like that, 20, something like that. And I said, you're with me for two hours. What do you think we're going to accomplish? Truly, in two hours. You know, it's the rest of your life that matters. It's what you're doing when you're not here, when nobody's looking, you know, and when you have full control over your time, that's what really matters. So that's why we don't call it exercise. 
Activity level was something different. Human beings were made to move. So issues from depression to back pain are actually directly related to not moving. And so, you know, Americans have sort of grown accustomed to being sedentary. You know, technology and cars and all these wonderful luxuries that we have don't allow us to move very much. And that causes us a lot of problems. And I really believe that more problems stem, well, there's a ton of research to back this up, that there are a ton of problems that are caused from not moving, and that you're actually at risk for more if you're not moving as opposed to moving. Make sense? I say that a lot. I want to make sure that I'm making sense to you all. <laughs> so the first step, of course, with your activity level is awareness. All right, so what is your activity level currently? Are you happy with it? Is it working? Do you have any reason for wanting it to change? So that's the first question I ask. Second, if you answered yes to any of the, well, if you answered yes to wanting to change it, the next question is, well, let's, let's have some awareness about your current activity level. What is it like? What does it look like? And why is it that way? And so before you can begin to implement more activity into your life, you really have to have a, an honest sense of your reality. You know, and again, for you all, it's a little different because, you know, you can't just wake up and go run six miles every day. Well, most people can't, actually. Um, but you're dealing with things that are sometimes out of your control. And so it's really about assessing, how do I feel today? What's reasonable for me? You know, what can I, what can my body tolerate? And what's going to be helpful? What's going to give me something rather than take something away? I also find a lot with activity level that there are a lot of underlying fears. And so a lot of times if somebody's not exercising, we'll get into the conversation a little bit and Often people have a lot of underlying fear. This could be because they don't know what to do. And so there's a little bit of a learning curve that needs to happen. Maybe that person needs to get some help to say, okay, well, this is probably reasonable for you as a beginner. Follow this program, et cetera, et cetera. You know, getting some resources to help for that. I worked with this woman once who really struggled in a lot of, well, she really struggled with her, with her exercise program and she would start something and stop and she was very, very apprehensive. And we dug into it a little bit and she actually had a, a torn, was, she was an athlete in high school and she tore her ACL very badly and was in a lot of pain for a lot of years. And it took, I don't even actually think that the knee ever fully healed itself. And so she had a really serious fear of exercise. She was so afraid after all those years that she was going to injure herself again that she kind of avoided it altogether. Now, that's not helping anything. And so what we had to do was make sure that she was assisted, she had some help, and that she did something that, you know, she did exercises that were appropriate for her body where she knew that she was safe. And then she was able to, con to have a consistent exercise program. You know, often the, one of the biggest um, reasons I hear that people don't exercise is, well, my back hurts. Well, your back probably hurts because you don't exercise. You know, and it's this, it's a slippery slope. And I just find that a lot of times people have a lot of reasons other than I just don't want to exercise or I don't feel that I need to. Another big one that I hear of all the time mm -hmm. is that I don't have the time. And just like people make time for things they think are important, I look at them and say, I don't believe you. And if you're like me, you're pretty busy, and your life is pretty full, and there isn't a whole lot of extra time, because human beings do that. Like, we take, we do this with time and money, I find. You know, if I have a certain amount of hours in a day, they're pretty full up, you know, in, 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 my, own, in my own manageable way. And I have to tell people, that do the same thing that I do, that you have to make the time rather than find the time. Because if you're trying to find extra time in your schedule, you're probably not going to find it. It's the same with money, but th that's a different lecture. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about money. Any questions on that? So lastly, the last point I want to drive home about activity level is focusing on what you can control and stop obsessing over what you can't. You know, you can't beat yourself up for the fact that you know, I used to be able to run a half mile when I was this age, and I've been through so much, and now I can't. Well, maybe you'll never run a half marathon again, but that's not an excuse not to exercise or to move your body. There's always something that you can do. There are gentle forms of exercise, non-impact forms of exercise. And if any of you want to talk more specifically, I know we kept it very general, 
But if any of you want to talk more specifically about activity level or exercise, I'm happy to do so. So you can either ask me now or we can also save a lot of time at the end for, for questions and answers. Any questions now? Okay, you guys are easy, easy crowd. Quiet, you make me nervous. <laughs> Quiet like that. Get a dog. Do you have a dog? A grand dog. That's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. And so, again, setting yourself up for success. We're going to talk about this in a different part of the presentation, but exactly. So if, you're acti if one of your goals is to increase your exercise, get outside and walk, what better way to do it than walk your dog? Walk your dog. Or, you know, you find a group of people, friends, in your support system that are doing the same thing. It's a system of accountability, and everyone benefits. That's great. Dogs are wonderful. Anyone else before we move on? Okay, next, pillar number two, we're going to talk about nutrition. So this is always a favorite topic. Always a favorite topic. As a nutritionist, this is also one of my favorites, but that would be wrong of me to pick a favorite of my own five pillars of wellness. But don't tell anybody, but nutrition is one of my favorites. So why is nutrition important? And, you know, you can make an argument with me, and it's an argument because I would tell you that I don't agree, but the other four, why they're not important to you. Nutrition, I believe, you can't, we all have to eat, right? We all have to eat. We don't have a choice here, necessarily. I mean, you do have a choice, but that won't work out well for you. Nutrition is important because every single thing that you put into your mouth becomes every part of your cells, every part of your cells. So we have millions of cells in our body, and literally everything that you throw down the hatch becomes part of those cells. So when they used to say when we were kids, you are what you eat, they weren't kidding. That is, in fact, true. Food affects everything that we do. So the food that you put into your body affects how you sleep. It affects your energy level. It affects your, your mood and your cognitive ability, so your ability to focus and your ability to churn out good work mentally. If that's not important, I don't know what is. So any questions so far on that? Does everybody believe me? When I say that, are we all on the same page about the, the good nutrition? Good. That makes my job a little bit easier. Food is fuel. And I think of everything in terms of energy because truly at the end of the day, we are all energy, right? And food is energy. And so food is actually fueling what we do. It's energy in, and then it equals the energy out. And so if we're eating a lot of crap and processed food, that's probably what we're going to get out. When we're eating, you know, healthy, nutritious food, and I'll explain more about what that means, then you can expect the same dividend in your energy output. I often find that, you know, it really amazes me that people actually spend more time and money thinking and obsessing about what goes into their car as opposed to what they're putting in their own bodies. And I really think that Americans have devalued food over the years. You know, we are a society that really sort of pats itself on the back for technology and taking shortcuts and getting a lot done with little resources in a shorter amount of time. And I think that our diets have really suffered for that. You know, and a lot of Americans eat convenience foods, which aren't really food. You know, and it's all about, we don't even sit down for dinner anymore, a lot of us, although all did a really great job of doing that. I was very pleased to be a part of that. Um, wonderful dinner, by the way. And so, again, as I said before, eating well must be a priority. If you don't think that eating well isn't a priority, then it's not going to happen for you. So the first step is always awareness. People always want to improve their diet, and I always have them keep a food diary because we need to get a really honest sense of what your diet looks like. I have found that people always overestimate the amount that they move, and they always underestimate the amount that they eat. Always. Always. It's the truth. And so I always have people keep a food diary so we can say, okay, well, you know, every time you stuck your hand in the candy jar on the secretary's desk, those things count. That sort of thing. You'd be amazed. You know, if you're curious, do that, and you would be absolutely amazed at what you, what you see. My philosophy, in a nutshell, and this is something that I could really expand on and talk about for a long time because nutrition is such a dynamic, rich topic. 
I try to keep it simple in, in a, I try to keep it simple. And I actually use, anyone know who Michael Pollan is? We don't have to go into it, but I just want to say this and tell you all that this actually isn't original to me. This is Michael Pollan's philosophy as well. And he, he says that we should eat food, mostly vegetables, and not too much. And so let's just break that down. Eat food. Well, that sounds pretty simple, right? Actually, most Americans eat things that look like food and smell like food and taste like food, but actually really aren't food. So Americans have taken shortcuts and Americans want to make money, right? And so what do they do? They create food in labs that last a long time, that don't lose their color or taste, and that oddly want you to eat more of it after you've eaten some. It's ridiculous. And you'll know that a food is not a food if there are 50 ingredients in the ingredient list that you can't even pronounce. Those things aren't food. Some of them, some natural foods have, you know, chemical names, so I can't say that maybe there's not some natural foods in there, but I guarantee that most of them are not. And so, first off, I would tell you all, you know, are you eating any processed food in your diet? And where is it coming from? And really try to move away from that. I'm not saying not to, you know, let's say you love Twizzlers. Anyone in here like Twizzlers? Twizzlers are pretty good, right? They're, they're good, but they're not food. I'm not going to tell you that you can't have your Twizzlers. I'm just saying I hope you're not eating Twizzlers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Makes sense, right? Okay. And so, and, and with all of these things, you know, again, there's, if there's a spectrum, I want you to find where you are on every single one of these topics. So for activity level, now we're on nutrition. You know, where are you on the spectrum? If my, this hand is totally horrible, that you don't even want to talk about it or share it with other people, to pretty darn perfect, which no one really gets to anyway, I want you to find out where you are on the spectrum, you know, have some honesty, and then maybe take a step or two up. So I'm not asking you to overhaul your diet. I'm just saying, if there are any areas in your life where you're not eating food, maybe find a better alternative. So eat food. Oh, one more thing about that. If you're ever in question about is something really a food or not, I want you all to think of a food now in your mind. Just think of something that you like, Twizzlers, anything. And then I want you to try to think about where that food comes from. And if you have to think of a couple steps, chances are that it's, it's further away from actually food. So if I think about an apple, that's really easy. I can see exactly where an apple comes from. If I think about chicken, I can see where chicken comes from in my head. It's, it's you know, a few degrees of traveling. Yes, Richard. Well, so there's a spectrum. You can find homemade, you can make your own ice cream. You could find ice cream in the store that has four ingredients and it's milk, and it's sugar, and it's vanilla. Yes, that's a food, because those five ingredients are whole foods, and that's pretty simple. So yes, there are also ice cream. There are some ice creams in stores. I don't know if you all know this. I love ice cream. There are some ice cream in stores that have no dairy in them whatsoever. It doesn't even come from milk. Isn't that weird? Don't you feel gypped? <laughs> and so all I'm suggesting is that just become curious. You know, like we should care about where our food comes from because it's going into every single one of those cells and it affects everything that we do. And so I'm just, I'm just hoping that you, you'll, you'll become a little bit more curious. And if you, I know there are people in this room, and I won't point them out, that, that have gone to, switched over to eating a whole foods diet and the changes are profound. Sleeping better, interacting better with themselves and others. I mean, not that specific person, but that's what happens when you really clean up your diet. It really makes a big difference. And so if you don't believe me, I challenge you to do that. All right, so eat food. Next, mostly vegetables. So I'm also not here to sell you on a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet, but we all should be eating mostly vegetables. Why? Here's why so. Vegetables are a whole food. They're a plant. You all have heard of antioxidants, correct? You get so much benefit from eating a vegetable. It's nutrient dense, it's low in calories. Your body gets so much from that food, as opposed to say something like butter, which is high in calories, and you know, you're not getting a whole lot from it. It tastes good, and I'm not saying don't have butter, trust me, but you, you see the point. So there are things in life called free radicals. I'm sure you all know what free radicals are. And we are exposed to free radicals everywhere. 
and I know all of you in this room have a pretty darn good understanding of what that means. Antioxidants battle free radicals. And so, you know, I almost see vegetables as sort of preparing our body for battle, you know, and it's just going to help us feel better, you know, and our body's going to, to get a lot more from fresh whole foods, mostly vegetables. They're also a very ro low risk food. And so you've never heard of anybody having any issue from eating too many carrots or too many, you know, too much salad, you know, and certainly, you know, there's no negative, there's no consequence to vegetables. Does that make sense? Okay, so eat food, mostly vegetables, and not too much. Because everything in moderation, too much of anything, even carrots and spinach on a salad, if you eat too much of them, it can make your life unmanageable. And so oftentimes, we have to talk about the concept of moderation. And, and I, I have this little saying with clients that's the 80-20 rule. And that is, if you're eating well, 80% of the time, the other 20% isn't going to matter. You can have Twizzlers, you can have ice cream that isn't really ice cream. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to affect you as much as if your diet was mainly consisting of those foods. So that's, that's that, the 80-20 rule. The other three really good concepts when it comes to nutrition, moderation we always talked about, variety and balance. And so variety, what I mean by that is, it's great if you're eating a healthy diet, but if you eat the same thing every day, that's also not good. And so you want to, ex you want to expose your body to as many nutrients and phytochemicals and, and good things as possible. And so our ancestors, I find this to be very interesting, but our ancestors back in the day, they were hunters and gatherers. And they weren't vegan, but they also didn't eat a lot of meat. So people think that cavemen ate a lot of meat, and that's actually not true. You know, cavemen didn't have the ability, hunters and gatherers didn't have the ability to kill animals every day. Okay, like they would kill um, a gazelle once a month, and they would have a feast, and they would eat meat, but meat in their diet was very moderate. And these people were actually very healthy. And so they've done all sorts of studies, this is, I'm not making this up, but they've done all sorts of studies on these people, and they didn't have the chronic diseases back then that we do now. They didn't have cavities. They didn't have nutri nutritional deficiencies. They had a very short lifespan, but that's because they, you know, the issues other than food. They, they didn't have great shelter, and they were really exposed to horrible conditions and, you know, animals, <laughs> quite frankly. And it wasn't until industrialization that we started getting nutrient deficiencies like scurvy and things like that. Because we took a diet that was full of thousands of species, hunters and gatherers, right? All sorts of plants in, 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 in nature. And we, industrialization, took the diet of humans and, and shortened it to eight things. Wheat, corn, and that's when we started to get all these problems. And that's how the processing of food has evolved to where it is today, where it's really not that healthy anymore. And there's actually quite a lot of, there's a lot of movements, and hopefully you know some of that, about trying to get back to a whole foods diet, a natural diet. And balance. What do I mean by balance? Balance, I mean that you have to have fat, you have to have protein, you have to have carbohydrates. And we can talk a little bit more if you're interested about what each of those means, but that regardless of what kind of diet you're subscribing to, that even if you're a vegan, that you're still getting plenty of carbohydrates, healthy fats, and protein. Next, and this is always, this is another topic we could really talk about in one evening. Eating behaviors in your relationship to food is very, very important. I often find that this is one, it's the most little discussed topic that really needs to be more in the forefront for all humans, regardless of what we're dealing with. Because your relationship with food is very different. I work with people a lot who want to lose weight but they overeat. And overeating is a big problem because people overeat because they're stressed, people overeat because they're bored, people overeat because they're angry. And so without going into too much detail here, you know, I would, I would say that if you're eating for any other reason other than hunger, then that's something that you have to address. I also think that we probably have the flip side in here possibly of not having an appetite and not wanting to eat. And you know, you have to come back to the middle somehow. And there are ways that we can talk more about that. But eating behaviors in your relationship to food. 
um, almost done on food. So educate yourself and find resources. Focus on lifestyle changes rather than diet. People are always asking me, well, what do you think about this diet? And what do you think about that diet? And my question back to them is, well, is this something that you can do for the rest of your life? And most often, the answer is no. And if it's not something that you can do for the rest of your life, then it's not sustainable. And it's probably not going to work. And so there's some statistic out there. I'm going to get it wrong. But, you know, 80% of diets don't work. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a couple reasons for that. But one of them is because it's not about a temporary fix. You know, if you just focus on improving your lifestyle overall, improving the way that you eat as a whole, and making it part of your life, then you'll far more succeed with that than trying to follow a book and doing something for a temporary period of time. Lastly, focus on small changes and accept setbacks. So small changes in your diet can make a big difference. You can make a big difference just by having breakfast, if you don't. You can make a big difference by making sure that you're getting six to eight servings of fresh vegetables a day. You can make a big difference by making sure that you're drinking enough water. Water is amazing, and most people don't drink enough water. Water is amazing. We don't have time to go into that either. But again, if you just make sure, pay attention, make sure that you're drinking enough water, I guarantee you're going to feel better than, you, than if you didn't. So small changes. And lastly, accepting setbacks. So often I work with with folks, or I've heard over the years, well, you know, I went to a party, or I got the flu, or, you know, something really bad in my life happened, and I fell off the bandwagon. And so, you know, they have this attitude, well, it doesn't really matter. Well, that's not true. It really does matter. And the reality is, is that all of us in this room are going to fail at some point or other of some change we're trying to make, because we're only human, and that's going to happen. We just have to accept that. But rather than make a weekend binge and do a whole month, you know, accept the fact that you were set back and just get back on the bandwagon. Any questions about nutrition? There's got to be something. Yes? Well, not all, let me go back to this. Not all processed food is bad. So, for example, Almond butter is a processed food, okay, because you take almonds and you process them, and that's almond butter. And so not all processed food is bad. It's, it's more or less food that has non-food items. And they're not surviving. We're a really sick country. Heart disease, stroke. There are so, uh, there, I don't know if I wrote it down here, but there's a statistic out there that, that the five top, and, Forgive me, because I'm trying to remember, and I don't have it written down, but the top five leading causes of death are either directly or indirectly related to the way that we eat. And so I don't know that we're surviving on processed food. We're obese, we're depressed. In this country, I'm speaking about this country, I'm not speaking about you, um, but we're not a very healthy country. And if you compare the U.S. and our stats on disease, chronic illness, obesity, and depression, we don't do well compared to other countries like Europe where they farm and they walk a lot and they don't snack in between meals. The data is out there. So I don't know that I would agree that we are surviving on processed food. Sure. We are living longer, but I think we can, uh, we can thank technology for that and the, the comforts of life. You know, we're not battling, you know, it's not like our ancestors where even though the insides were a lot healthier, you know, they, they didn't have a roof over their head. And we're much more protected from, you know, acts of God, so to speak. Yeah, I believe so. So olive oil, again, is a processed food, but it's olives. It's just processed olives. And so there are healthy fats that... <coughs> There's a lot of different kinds of fats, and I don't want to get too scientific on you all here, but there are polyunsaturated fats and there are saturated fats. And we need fat. Fat is vital to our life and to a lot of things that are bodily functions. And olive oil, so let me, let me break it down to you this way. The, the fats that come from plants are much healthier than the fats that come from animals. And so we should limit the fats that come from animals, and so that's, you know, full-fat milk, any kind of full-fat dairy, you know, red meat, meats that have a lot of fat in them, 
as opposed to fats that come from vegetables. The fats that come from vegetables actually help our cholesterol. The fats that come from, did I say vegetables? Did I say that? The fats that come from animals contribute to high cholesterol. Does that make sense? So yes, olive oil is a healthy food. Everything in moderation. Anyone else? No? Okay. All right, so the next, and again, if you think of anything, save it to the end. Interrupt me if you have any questions along the way. So the third pillar is stress management. Stress is always a favorite topic, right? Because who in this room experiences stress, right? Everyone. Stress is inevitable. The first thing I want to say about stress is that stress can sabotage all of your best wellness efforts. And so let's say that you're really doing a really good job of exercising, making sure you're active, you're eating well, you know, you've got a good support system, you're following your treatment plans, but you're really stressed out. That stress can undermine everything that you're doing that's good for yourself. Stress, they don't call it the silent killer for no reason. I'll talk more about that. Well, let's talk a little bit about the difference between acute stress and chronic stress. The first thing I have to say is that Stress is inevitable. It's just part of life, okay? Stress necessarily isn't the problem. It's how we react to it, okay? So I'm not here to sell you on the, the idea that you can live a stress-free life. That's just not true. But what I can tell you is, is that you can do things to make yourself more stress resilient so that stress isn't affecting you as badly and making your life unmanageable. <laughs> So there, are, there is acute stress and there's chronic stress. Acute stress is like sitting in traffic or somebody cutting you off or, you know, an argument that you have with somebody, something intense and in the moment. Chronic stress is stress that's last, that lasts a long time, over a period of time. And that's the type that I want to talk about. Acute stress is inevitable, right? It's the chronic stress that we're worried about. You know, it's all about awareness, right? First step is awareness. So is there something in your life that's causing chronic stress, day to day, wearing you down, making your life unmanageable, then that's a problem and we need to talk about it. Chronic stress predisposes us to all chronic conditions. And so if you have chronic stress, you know, it predisposes us to mental illness, to premature aging, and an, inab an inability to lose weight. It also really suppresses our immunity. And so we get sick a lot easier. You know, get a lot of colds, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of times when people have the goal, and again, I'm using, I'm going back to my personal training days because I have a lot of experience there in working with one-on-one -on -one individuals. A lot of times when people want to, want to lose weight, but they're unable to, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about it, and I'll say, well, is there anything in your life that's causing you a lot of stress? And if there is, well, that's a pretty good reason why that person can't lose weight. Because what's happening is when your body is in the chronic fight or flight syndrome, it's in survival mode. And your body doesn't care about, about weight. Your body's holding on to every single ounce of energy it has to prepare for battle. And a lot of our stress response is antiquated, right? Because back to our ancestors, like, we don't have the need for fight or flight all the time anymore. You know, we're not confronted with the same type of dangers that our ancestors were. And so our stress response system is actually quite outdated, but it still exists. And so, again, first step is awareness. There are two things that I want to talk about specifically for all of you, and that, are, that is your stress triggers and also your stress manifestations. So what do you think a stress trigger might be? That's a great one. That's a trigger. What else? So a fear, a specific fear about a condition. Absolutely. What else? What else is a stress trigger? So a stress, yes. Financial, financial stress. That's a huge stress. Huge stress. So it's important for us to have some awareness about what are the triggers in our life that activate our stress response. And it's going to be different for everybody in this room. So each single person in this room reacts differently. Some people are more stressed out about others. That's why you can have two people right next to one another faced with a similar threat 
and they're gonna have a different response because their triggers are a little different. Some people are afraid of public speaking. Some people are afraid of treatment. Some people aren't afraid of treatment. You see what I'm saying here. What do you think a stress manifestation is? So a stress, yes, Christine. Exactly. So this is also going to be different for everybody in the room. So stress manifests in your body is different from the next person. So when you are faced with a danger, there are 1,400 biochemical responses that happen in your body. And it's a little bit different for everybody because you each have different bodies. And so some people, when they get stressed, they get irritable. For some people, when they get stressed, they have a racing heart. They get sweaty palms. They have butterflies in their stomach. They can't speak. So everyone responds to stress differently. And so I bring this up because I really believe in every person making an individual stress management plan. I think it's very important, and I don't think that for the amount of energy time that you put into it, it's absolutely worth it. The dividends are great. And it just requires some thought and some awareness about your reality. So the first two questions I would ask are, what are your stress triggers, and how do you react to stress? The manifestations are important because I really find, too, that um, we as people, you know, we avoid discomfort, right? When we avoid, we, we have things like denial that protect us and make us feel better, right? And so a lot of times I work with people who are under so much stress but really don't even realize it. And their body is screaming for help, you know, and their mind is screaming for help. But they, they can't see, they can't see that it's really stress that's undermining their ability to function. And so stress manifestations are important because when you know and you're aware of how your body responds to stress, then that's communicating something to you about something in your environment. Does that make sense? We're all on the same page. So stress triggers and stress manifestations. So once you know those two things, build a stress management, well, before that actually, then you have to get, take an honest evaluation of, of those things. And it goes back to the serenity prayer. What about your life can you change? And what can you not? Acceptance is one of the most powerful, powerful tools that any of us in this room can use. You know, if we are battling something in our life that's really causing us, really causing us difficulty, what if we were just to accept it? If we can't change it, what would happen if we would just accept it? We would probably give ourselves a break, right? Because not much else can change. It is so difficult to stop obsessing over things that we can't, but it's so stressful to think about something that you have no control over. It's pointless. You know, so rather than obsess about those things, think about what you can do. I think this is really important. So I'll give you an example. You know, you cannot, you cannot control your illness, right? You can't control what, what your, your condition. You can't control the cancer. You can't control the treatment. There are things about that that, that well, I can't say all of that's true, but for a lot of you, every circumstance is different. Most often, there are a lot of things you have to accept. What can you change? How can you make yourself feel better? Spend more of your energy there. Um, do you have a toxic person in your life? This is a great example. I was going to make you raise your hands for that, but I won't do that to you. <laughs> I won't do that. Um, I'll speak for myself. I had a really toxic person in my life. It, she was a family member, actually. And I idolized this person for a really long time. And but she was a little abusive, you know, emotionally. And she would say things that weren't very nice. And I, all I ever wanted was her affection and her love and her approval. And I, it took me a long time, but I finally arrived at the fact that this person was not helping me. She was not helping me, and she wasn't doing anything good for me in my life. And she wa I wasn't leaving my interactions with this person better. I was, uh, she was draining my energy. She was taking more from me than I was getting back in return. And this is a relative, right? And so I had to take control. And for years I thought, well, there's nothing I can do about this person because she's my ex, and meaning, you know, fill in the blank. And what can I do about it? Nothing. Well, one day I had this revelation, like, you know what? I can do something. 
And I actually didn't talk to her for about a year. She doesn't live here, so that made that easy. But I didn't, I wouldn't accept her calls. And I said, listen, I know you're trying to be loving and kind, but it's not, the way that you're doing that is not helpful to me. And it took every ounce of gusto that I had to do this. This was years ago. And um, I'm happy to say that we have a much better relationship now. The whole relationship has changed. Now, I'm not saying if you do this, this will be your story. I'm just telling you my story. But I tell you this because oftentimes we think that we don't have the ability to do something or to change something in our life, but we do. You absolutely do. And that's my point there. Make sense? Okay. So your stress management plan, I mentioned that a little while ago. Stress management plans are based on two things, stress prevention activities and stress reduction techniques, two different things. So stress prevention, tech, stress prevention activities are things that you do, not necessarily when you're stressed, but that you really enjoy. And so have you all heard of flow, like doing something and you find your flow? You've heard of that. Do any of you have an activity that you love so much that time just flies by? and you're doing something and you're so into it and you look at the clock and the day is done, that's what I'm talking about. So something that you can lose yourself in. For some people it's gardening, some people it's music, cooking, yoga, um, spending time with animals or a dog, that sort of thing. Those are stress prevention techniques. Those are things that are building your stress resiliency. There, it's taking the time to do something important and meaningful to you because just because you enjoy it for no other reason. Does everyone have something like that in their life? Awesome. And so I work a lot with companies. And you'd be surprised, but there are a lot of people that, that can't name something like that. I don't have time. I don't, and, I, and I always say, if you had an hour, so if you're struggling to find something that fits that category, my question to you would be, is there something in your life, if you had an hour and you couldn't, um, if you had an hour to yourself and you could do anything you want, what would you do? And oftentimes the answer to that question is something that I'm talking about, is the stress prevention technique. Stress reduction is a little different. So once your body is in a stress response, it's really sort of hard to kind of rein it all in because of those biochemical processes. So we've all had that experience, I'm sure, where it feels like the train left the station. And once the train left the station, there's not much you can do to kind of reel it all in. And so there are certain things that you can do to help calm yourself down. So deep breathing would be one of them. Meditation, exercise. It's essentially taking a part of your brain and using a different part and distracting yourself enough to turn off the stress response. And so the list is long for that. And of course, I wish we had more time to talk about it. But meditation was mentioned. That's a great one. Meditation simply is observing your mind non-judgmentally. That's it. Um, deep breathing is going to activate the part of your body that's responsible for turning off the stress response. It's really that amazing. Um, I think we take deep breathing for granted. If we had more time, we would do some of that. If we can do some at the end, too. Um, so does everyone, is everyone clear on the differences? And so, you know, educate yourself on the list of each and find what you enjoy. Find something that you enjoy and practice. That's the other thing about stress management, the final thing I want to say. Um, you know, all of this stuff, eating well, activity level, stress management requires practice. Like, I don't expect to come here and speak to all of you and then you're magically transformed tomorrow into healthier people. You know, you have to practice these things until it becomes easier. You can try any new activity, as simple as it may be, and it's going to feel a little awkward because it's new and it's outside of your comfort zone. And so I would just remember to encourage all of you, it's just practice, practice, practice. You know, and the first time you try some deep breathing when you're really stressed out might not have much effect. But I guarantee that if you're persistent and you keep doing it, that eventually one day will happen, hopefully in the not so distant future, where all of a sudden you realize that you actually are feeling a lot better just from inhaling and exhaling a little deeply. Any questions on stress management? Okay, so mindfulness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Physical. Yes. So the stress manifestations are how our body reacts to stress physically, mentally, cognitively, psychologically. So everything. So physically would be 
you know, the heart racing, the butterflies in the stomach, correct. Emotionally, I get mad, you know, exactly. Cognitively, I can't focus because I'm so stressed out. Psychologically, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm under a chronic stress response for so long that I'm actually depressed. So those are four examples. Yes. Any other questions? Mindfulness. So mindfulness is popular these days. Um, mindfulness is making a comeback. But essentially, mindfulness, in a nutshell, is the ability to remain in the present moment. So pretty simple, right? Actually, Americans and humans in general are not that great at this. Mindfulness is actually much more difficult because I don't mean to knock on Americans so much. I guess it sounds really like I am, but I'm one of them, so I include myself in this group. We have been trained to be not mindful. We have been trained to multitask, to do multiple things at once, which is multitasking, um, to feel guilty about all the things in life that we're not doing, you know, more, 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 more. Think ahead. That's not mindfulness. So mindfulness is spending too much time in the future, which some people call anxiety, or spending too much time in the past, which some people call depression. It's not so simple, but I've heard that. I don't know if anyone else in here has as well. So the other thing about mindfulness is that it's non-judgmental. So it's accepting the present moment exactly how it is without judgment. That's hard. That's hard because if anyone else is in this room like me, you know, I can be very judgmental. My brain has to come up with a judgment for everything. And that's okay because I'm human and that's what I've learned over the years. But I've slowly been training myself not to do that, or at the very least not to act on that judgment. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So mindfulness is not easy. I've said that. Okay, did that one. Mindfulness is a primary stress management tool, primary. And so if you take nothing else from me this evening about stress, this is what I want you to take away. Mindfulness is the number one anecdote, and this is why. If we accept exactly where we are in the present moment, this isn't stressful right now. No one's stressed out right now, are you? Okay, I don't mean to keep putting everybody on the spot, but no, it's not, because in the present moment, we have full authority over ourselves, right? If we're always thinking about the future, if we're thinking about something that's going to happen in a week, that's really stressful. Why? Because we have no control over that. We have no control. So why are we spending all of our mental energy and time thinking about something that hasn't happened yet? And I guarantee that however we think it's going to look, taste, feel, it's not going to be that way, for better or for worse. Also, it's the same when you're thinking about the past. It's really stressful thinking about things that have happened in the past. Why? Because you can't change them. And so we have absolutely no authority over anything other than right now, right here. And so it really behooves all of us to really practice staying in the moment. Because this is where we have the most authority. And that's why mindfulness is really, really important and really profound and can instantly change your life and your day. Did you have your hand up? No. Did you have your hand up? So, awareness. How mindful are you? So people think that this is pretty simple, and I always say, well, let me give you some examples. Has anyone ever had the experience of driving somewhere in the car and not remembering the drive? You know, so you end up somewhere and you really can't remember how you got there? That's lack of mindfulness. And so mindfulness can be very consequential, right? Um, oftentimes, you know, if I'm, if I'm cooking something and my mind is somewhere else, I can cut myself. I can really hurt myself if I'm not being mindful. I can be negligent. At the very worst, mindfulness is negligent. You know, if you're watching your kids or somebody else's and you're not being mindful to what you're doing, that could end up very badly. You know, again, I, I work a lot with corporations. There's a huge price to pay for lack of mindfulness. You know, if you miss something at work because, you know, you're so distracted and your mind can't focus, that has a lot of consequence. I know for me when I'm really anxious and I'm trying to read something, I don't know if any, I'm sure someone in this room has had this experience where I read the same line over and over and I still have no clue what it, what it said. And that's when I know, okay, Nicole, like you need to step away from the sentence and take a few deep breaths and go back to the sentence. That's my example of lack of mindfulness. So how do we become mindful? 
Anyone have any idea? No? Yes. So that's a great first step, yes. Mindfulness is practicing. And so I would encourage all of you to find two minutes a day to just be completely and utterly in the present moment. So oftentimes I'll tell people, when you're brushing your teeth, be completely mindful. Look at your teeth, experience brushing your teeth, just be there for two minutes. And you, it's amazing how time will slow down. Or I'll say, you know, just be mindful. For a lot of folks that have a hard transition from work to home, I'll say, well, when you're in the car, just be mindful. Turn the music off. Don't make phone calls. Pay attention to what you're doing and be completely in tune with the experience. There are other examples of mindfulness. So again, when I asked you in stress management about those things that you really love to do, finding your flow, often those are the best ways to practice mindfulness. So for me, yoga, actually, I found yoga about eight years ago um, by accident, <laughs> um, and it totally backdoored me. I went to yoga because it was another type of exercise. That's what I was, I was signing up for another type of workout. And what I found after doing yoga for a couple years, truly, was that I had this amazing, deep, rich breath, and that I felt so good. And that for that hour of my life, there was nothing else I was thinking about except being there on my mat doing all the different things that we were doing in class. That's mindfulness. And if you can only do two minutes a day of just utter mindfulness, that's enough. And then you can build on that from there. But find something that you really enjoy and practice. Meditation is mindfulness. They're the same thing. I mean, mindfulness is a bigger umbrella. Meditation is part of it. But yes, Richard. Yes. So not all lack of mindfulness is bad. I'm talking about obsessing about things that make our life unmanageable. So let me be clear on that. So you're absolutely right. There are times in life where we have to plan. And actually, there's, um, I read recently an article that was very interesting. I don't know this is, if this would work for me. But it said, you know, plan a vacation. Like, actually go through all the steps and without, like, purchasing the vacation. And that your mind, and you'll, you'll actually gain some benefit from that, even if you never take the vacation. So to your point, yes. I mean, obviously, there are times in our life where we have to think ahead. Just don't spend your entire day there. You know, when we're spending too much time outside of the present moment where it's making our life unmanageable to the point where we can't read the sentence or we can't focus on work or we, you know, or if you're having a conversation with somebody, and you have no clue what they said because you're so you're in your head thinking about what you're going to say next. That's what I'm talking about. So two separate things. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions on mindfulness? So find small pockets in your daily life to practice mindfulness. So mindfulness. There we go. So the last pillar of wellness is support system. And I think support system is awfully important. And I am going to venture a guess that every single one of you in this room, off the bat, has a pretty decent support system because you're here. And I happen to think that our clubhouse is one of the best support systems for folks like yourselves in Pittsburgh. And you all are really onto something here. Um, support system, I'm sure you could probably guess, are people, places, and things that support you in an unconditional, honest, way. So unconditional meaning they're supporting your healthy efforts even if they don't agree with them. And honest meaning they're not co-signing things just to make you feel better. They're not co-signing your bad attitude or bad behavior. That they're honest with you because at the end of the day that's what's going to help us, right? Is some honesty. People, places, and things. So people, obviously we all know what people are. Family and friends. Other people that you can commiserate with. Places. Our clubhouse is a place. And things. So people always say, well, what kind of thing can be in my support system? Let's say that, you know, my fitness diary. I don't know if any of you know what that is. But for people that are trying to eat healthier, my fitness diary is, no, it's my fitness pal. I had that wrong. My fitness pal. is uh, It's an application on the computer or your phone where you can actually keep a food diary. And it's actually quite helpful. And so that could be considered part of your support system. 
The one most important thing about support system, as I just told the story about my family member, is that it's comprised of people, places, and things that you mostly choose. So sometimes we can't, like for example, if you work, if you have a daytime job, <clears throat> that's a support system, right? Because you know, you're working together with your team of people to a greater end. And you can't control your colleagues at work. So not all support systems are within our locus of control. But the point that I want to drive home is that in terms of people who are supporting you personally, you have a choice. You do have a choice. So uh, people, places, and things that you choose. So the, the first step is always awareness. So each of you in this room, what is your support system? Who is part of your support system? You can all think in your mind about that. Is it working? Are these people helping you to a greater end? Are they supporting your efforts? Are they making you feel badly? I've had a lot of experience too where um, a couple, there's a couple, and one person decides to make all these healthy changes, and the other person actually resents them for it. That's very common. And so to my point that it's people that you choose, you can have a spouse, and they don't have to be in your support system. They can just be your spouse, and that's okay. Um, I would suggest, though, that if your spouse isn't supportive of your healthy efforts, that you find people who are. I don't think I need to say any more about that. That makes sense, right? Any questions about that? There is so much good in the world. There are people that want to help other people. There are always people that want to be supportive. And I just hope that if someone in this room doesn't feel like they have enough support, that you would have the resources to feel like you could you could have that. And if you don't, then you can see me after. Any questions on support system? Wonderful. You have been an awfully easy crowd. So those are the five pillars of wellness. Activity level, good nutrition, mindfulness, stress management, and support system. Is there any other questions about those? So real quickly then, I had a little exercise I wanted us to do. I don't know how much time, I don't think we have enough time to do the full throttle, but I just wanted to talk about chains in general. So let me see a show of hands. From what we've talked about this evening, has anyone thought in this room thought of maybe one small change that they might make in their life to be healthy, more healthy? Okay, a couple, great, wonderful. So keep that in mind. So let's backtrack a little bit. Has anybody in this room ever tried to make a change and been unsuccessful? Myself included. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly in the interest of time. So reasons for unsuccessful change. Again, little awareness. You have to really have a good understanding of what your reality is before you can change it. Only then can you make a change. Expectations. Starting where you want to end up. It's about gradual change. Most people cannot overhaul their lifestyle overnight. Most people. Some people can, but they are few and far between. So I suggest taking, taking your goal, your change, and breaking it down in small incremental steps. Same old routine. I love this. If nothing changes, nothing changes. I'll go back to exercise because it's an easy example for me. If somebody has been doing the same exercise routine for 10 years, you can't expect to make any change by doing the same routine. Lack of confidence. If you don't feel that you can eat healthier, if you don't feel like you can make some positive effect on your stress level, you won't. You won't. There's nothing I can say or do with all of you this evening to help you unless you first believe that it is possible. Lack of support. We all need support. So again, back to us Americans. Uh, we are taught that we are individuals and that we shouldn't ask for help because asking for help and vulnerability mean weakness. And I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely false. Absolutely false. And that the more we ask for support and the more honest we are about our vulnerability, the greater things we will be able to achieve. Fear. We're all afraid about something, right? And that's okay because we're human. As long as fear doesn't own us. And as long as fear doesn't keep us from doing positive things with ourselves. If you have fear about making a change, you have to address it. You have to face it and talk about it. Ask for help 
and, and work with it. And lastly, failure to plan. Plan to, what is that saying? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I can't say it better myself. So the recipe for successful change. So when I asked in the beginning about, about change, the two ladies had it. The first step is awareness. It, addressing the fact that we need change, right? Saying to ourselves, okay, I need to make a change in X area. Two, find your why. Why is it important? You have to remember this. You have to remember. If your why to increasing your activity level is because it makes you feel better, then write yourself a little note. Say, dear self, I don't always feel like going out and taking a walk, but when I do, I feel so much better. And so fast forward a week, when you wake up and your energy level is really low and you really feel crappy and the weather's not great and all you want to do is stay in bed, read your little note. That's finding your why and that's remembering, I'm sorry, reminding yourself of why it's important to do that. Planning. You have to plan. It can be really simple or it can be really elaborate, but you have to have a plan. If you want to, you know, meet with neighbors and take your dogs for a walk three days a week, well, that requires some, some planning with them, making sure that they're available, making sure the weather is okay, making sure, you know, your dog's ready to go and he's got his leash or whatever. Preparation is buying a new leash, buying walking shoes, making the phone call. It's actually action steps that are born from planning. Accountability and support. I love accountability. Oftentimes people can't maintain their wellness programs because they don't have a, a they don't have a, a system of accountability in place. It's like the tree that falls in the forest. If the tree falls in the forest, does it ever really make a sound? Well, you could argue not if nobody's there to hear it. So if you have a goal and you don't tell anybody, does it really matter if you fail? Eh, no, probably not. Well, we could argue that too, but you get my point. And so it's important to share and have a system of accountability so that when you fast forward to a week, don't feel like taking that walk, and you call your neighbor and say, neighbor, I just don't feel like it. And the neighbor says, tough cookies, I'm coming to get you. That's your system of accountability. And lastly, consistency. Consistency is so important. So oftentimes we make these changes and, you know, we want to see results now. Not just now, but yesterday. You know, we want what we want when we want it, and we want it now. And often, I have to remind people, it's about consistency. You know, and you might not feel a direct effect from meditating, but you have to be patient and just be consistent. There's a saying out there, don't, don't, um, don't leave five minutes before the miracle happens or something. And I think that's so profound. Just hang on a little bit longer and be consistent. Recipe for successful change. Any questions? Yes. Do you have any suggestions on how to stay consistent? How to stay consistent. Yes. And so I have a few, actually. Can you give me a little more? Give me a general um, area. Well, say you're walking. You know, your goal is to walk three times a week. But maybe you only get one time. You know, how do you consistently get to those? Because it's actually going to be a build-up. You know, maybe it's once this week, twice next week, then you start with the three times a week. But to stay consistent and don't let other things take you away from that activity. Sure. I mean, I, I guess it comes back down to making the time. Sure. There's a, well, so I don't have a short answer, but yes. So consistency, how to be consistent. I think the shortest answer I have for you is to set up a system of accountability and support so that you're not always relying on yourself to do it. So if your plan is to walk, let's say, and again, you know, there are circumstances with all of you where you really have to be very compassionate and aware of, you, of, your, of your body each and every day. You know, and there are legitimately going to be some days where you wake up and you're allowed to stay in bed, and that's fine. I just challenge all of you, in a sense, to just have a really good sense of when that's real and when it's not. That's all. Does that make sense? Is that fair? That's a fair request? Okay, so let's say that your, your goal is to walk consistently. And so there are a number of things that you could do. You could do this in an online community or you can enlist some friends and family or neighbors. And you can say, let's have a goal to walk 10 days out of the month. And so for 10 days in April, I'm going to walk for this amount of time. And so you have a little calendar 
This is just one example. You have a little calendar, you put it up on your refrigerator, and every day that you walk, you put a little star. And so it's a visual reminder each and every day when you go in and out of your refrigerator, hey, I walked, or I have five more days that I have to walk this month. And so that's a system of accountability. I know with a lot of these online, you know, there are a million ways to do this. You can enlist in a, a walking group online where, my husband bought me a Fitbit. Does anyone know what a Fitbit is? Okay. I use it somewhat. <laughs> I'm a pretty active person and I tend, I try not to obsess over what I do. But it's great because if I walk over a certain amount of steps, it sends me an email to congratulate me. That's great. And so there are ways that you can set a system up to remind you. Um, but I, again, like, my hesitation is that y your circumstances are unique. And so I would want to talk to you a little bit more specifically and we could find exactly how you could be consistent. But those are just some examples. Did I answer your question? Okay. There are lots of ways to be consistent. You have to find what works for you. Are you a people person? Are you individual? Are you a technology person? Are you a gadget person? Do you like to write things down? You could reward yourself so that after you made, after you have those 10 notches, you could go out to your favorite restaurant and eat anything you wanted or something like that. Or you bought yourself a new, I don't know, something. Make sense? What else? Anyone else have any other questions? So you all have been a wonderful audience. This was a list of questions that I had saved up for the end. So for each and every one of you, I had said, you know, think of one small change that you want to make and then take yourself down this list and just read them. And if you can have a solid answer for each and every one, and you implement this, you won't fail. Any questions? Does anyone give a, want to give a go at that publicly? I'm happy to give an example, too. I'm going to use your example, if that's okay. I'll, I'll make it about me, though. So the one small change that I'd like to implement is that I would like to get outside and walk as many days in a week as possible. So I don't want to say seven, but um, bear with me as you hear my introspection, my process, okay? So my goal is that I want to get outside every day, not really just for exercise, but really just for fresh air, just to get outside at some point every day. Why is it important? Because every time I go outside and I smell fresh air, it really helps me to be mindful, and I feel, really, I feel a lot better. It's like a break in my day. What were the reasons you were unsuccessful in the past at making this change? Well, because I forgot why it was important for me. That's why I didn't work in the past. How will you benefit from this change? Well, my stress level will go down. I'll probably be more productive when I come back inside. I'll be much more pleasant with my family. And I'll probably sleep better at night, I'm guessing. That's how I'm going to benefit from getting outside every day. What is my specific plan? My specific plan is, let's see, let's see. Let me think about my day. OK, well, I usually have a break about 2 o'clock. And so I'm going to set a timer on my phone to go off at 2 o'clock every day, actually no, 10 minutes before, to remind me, hey, it's almost time to go outside. And if for whatever reason I can't because the weather's bad or I don't know, I don't feel very well, that I'll reset it for four hours later. That's my plan. That's the plan. Um, what will be my main obstacles and how will you handle them? My kids. And I'll handle them, you know, I'll either invite them along with me or say, you know, Husband, can you watch the kids while I go outside for 10 minutes? What can I do specifically to prepare to make this change? I can tell somebody, and I'll ask that person to ask me at the end of every week, did you get outside every day? So I have to answer to them. What or who will hold me accountable for this change? Well, I'll ask my husband that if he hears my alarm go off and doesn't see me go outside, to remind me to go outside, and that person that I told to ask me at the end of every week, She'll be my system of accountability. Who or what will support me? Those people, same people. How will I know I've succeeded at making this change if I go outside every day? 
Make sense? So you see how the process works. And I'm happy to share that with you too, if you'd like. So that concludes my presentation. You guys have been a wonderful audience. It's always hard for me to gauge reactions when nobody's really saying too much. So I really hope that every single one of you got something out of this presentation. And if you did, I'd love to know what. Um, I love this. I love this. And again, I just want to drive home the, the, the point that every single person in this room has had difficulty and struggle and has been, has, you know, a circumstance that you really have no control over. I promise you that there's always something you can do to help yourself make yourself feel better. And that's really the point in me coming here tonight. And I really hope you believe that. I hope all of you have a good rest of your evening. I wish you all the best. Um, if you do social media, we have a website and we have a blog. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'm updating these things every day with recipes, exercises, pictures, motivational quotes of all sorts. And so I have business cards. If you'd like to take one when you leave, please find me. Stay in touch. If you have any questions, I am more than happy to help every single one of you in this room. Thank you. Thank you.